Hello friends and welcome to Bendigo in Victoria. Now if you haven't seen any of the Outback Flying videos on this channel yet, um, some of this might not make sense, so click on this link above, go back to the beginning, watch the videos and then come back here. If you have seen those videos or if you clicked on that link and you're now back here. Either way, I'm going to share with you my top tips on all the key things that I learned from flying around Australia over the last two weeks so you can plan a trip like this yourself. Tip number one, start big. What I mean by that is have a plan, but don't start worrying about all the minute planning details too early on in the process. Have your big plan, like you wanna fly from Sydney to Melbourne, or you wanna fly around Australia, or you wanna fly around the world. Whatever it is, have your big plan set in your head first, and once you know what that is, then start to cut it up into smaller pieces. Flying from Sydney to Melbourne, well, okay, where might you refill along the way? Flying around Australia, well, okay, how many days do you think you've got? And how long does each leg have to be? Start big, narrow down, and eventually you'll get to the point where you're looking at specific airfields. And from that point on, to be honest, it's quite easy. Secondly, once you've got your big plan and then you've narrowed down and you know which airfields you're gonna be going to, call them up. Even if it's a few weeks before you visit, call them up and tell them that you're planning to visit, you've never been there before, and have they got any helpful information or any tips they can give you on local procedures. You can often speak to someone from air traffic control as well if it's a towered aerodrome and they'll be really helpful giving you the procedures of how you should be getting in and out of that airfield. Also ask them about things like parking, where can you leave your aircraft? Ask them about fuel, have they got refueling facilities? And make sure you've got a plan for how you're going to get from the airport to your accommodation that night as well. I set up a spreadsheet of every place I was going to and had those exact three columns. Where am I going to park the aircraft? How am I going to get fuel? And how am I going to get to my accommodation that night? Number three, when you know which airfields you're going to and you've called them up beforehand to find out how to get there, your next tip is check them out on Google Maps. If you see the airport on Google Maps beforehand, it's almost like you've flown in there before. You can visualize how big are the turning zones at the end of the runways. You can see where all the taxiways go. You can have a look at where fuel is so you know that when you pull off the taxiway, you know exactly which direction you need to head to fuel up. I personally think Google Maps is such an underused resource for pilots that if you are going into an airport that you've never been to before, just pull it up on Google Maps, have a look down, and basically, like I say, you're almost flying there and you've seen the airport before you've even visited. Next up, fuel, but actually more importantly, how to pay for your fuel. If you're traveling around some of the Outback airstrips like I've been doing the last couple of weeks, don't rock up to an airport and expect just to be able to use your credit card. It's really gonna suck if you're stuck there and you can't put fuel in your tanks simply because you can't pay for it. I carried a couple of different methods for paying. I basically had three on me at any one time. I had a credit card, be it a Visa or MasterCard. I had what they call a BP Carnet card, which is basically just a card you can use to refuel at BP Bowser's, and I had cash. If you give yourself some more options, you're more likely to be able to pay for fuel when you really need it, which is all the time, right? Anyway, next tip. Just a quick note to uh, everyone watching this, Bendigo is a fantastic town. If you live in Australia and you're, especially if you're living in Melbourne, you want to come and visit somewhere cool in the country, come to Bendigo. Anyway, next tip, my instructor Mike Walden, who you've seen on some other videos on this channel, always says to me, KYA, 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 know your aircraft. You want to have all your speeds down pat for all your basic functions like takeoff, landings, glide speeds in your head, or do what I do and write them down on a piece of paper which I keep in my flight plan so they're there all the time. Because to be honest, you do forget sometimes, but you need to have access to them. Emergency procedures are the other big one as well. You've got to know what to do in your aircraft in the event of an emergency. I mean, what happens if you lose your electrics? What happens if you lose your engine? What happens if you lose your communications facilities? The aircraft I've been flying around Australia, the SR-22, has got a checklist which sits in the console next to me and has got a whole section on emergency procedures. And I keep that next to me at all times. And you've got to know your aircraft and know how it's gonna handle in the normal situations, of course, but in those emergency situations especially. It's so cool, they're practicing for the Chinese festival here. They're all practicing how to be dragons. Okay, next tip. Talk to your instructor and do an entire day of emergency training. 
And what I mean by that is similar to the last tip is you want to know what to do in your aircraft in the event of something bad happening. And having your instructor next to you to go through simulated things like engine failures, practice force landings, communication failures, partial avionics failures, all those fun things, when you can do it with your instructor next to you, you're not kind of guessing your way through it. And it is always going to be easier to do something for real if you have to, if only recently you've been through it as a simulation with your flight instructor sitting next to you. Know your limits. And this becomes even more important on these longer flights to places you're not familiar with. So what is your minimum cloud base that you'll accept before you'll cancel the flight? What's the maximum crosswind that you want to put up with before you think I'm not going to land there? What's the maximum flight duration, not just from a fuel point of view, but from your own personal fatigue? Set your personal minimums. I recommend you write them down and take them with you. And then you'll know your limits and it doesn't become a case of, oh, should I, shouldn't I? If anything's outside of the parameters that you've already set for yourselves, just don't fly. Next tip, and I'm gonna sit down for this one because this one's important. Also, the grass is wet. Ah, we've sat now. Always, always, always put in a flight plan. If there's one key thing I learned when I visited air traffic control the last couple of times on this channel and made those videos about the best practices for pilots, it's if you put a flight plan in the system, if you need help at any point during the stage of your flight, whatever it might be, it might not be an emergency, you might just need some assistance with a diversion or some traffic assistance. If you have a flight plan in the system and air traffic control know what your intentions are, it's gonna make it far easier for them and probably far quicker for them to be able to help you. And just a quick bonus tip as well on top of that one, always put in a SAR time or a search and rescue time. Now I know it can be a bit of a hassle sometimes, and look, let's be honest here for a second, okay? Hands up, anyone watching this, who's put in a SAR time and has forgotten to cancel it and has been called by air traffic control rather frostily about why you haven't canceled your SAR time. Hands up who's done that. Well, at the end of the day, it's really your decision as a pilot, but my opinion and my learnings from this whole experience about flying through very remote parts of Australia has been knowing that I've got a flight plan in the system and knowing that air traffic controller are expecting me and the plane to be at a certain place at a certain time. If I don't turn up there for any reason, I know that people are gonna start looking for me. And that was quite a reassuring feeling when I was traveling across those remote parts of the country. I know I've been flying solo around the country and I wanted to do that on purpose. It was a bit of a personal challenge to fly solo and kind of do the whole thing without help from anybody else sitting next to me. But if this is something new for you and you've never done one of these long trips before, my next bit of advice is try and go with someone else. Now, obviously you can't teach them to fly the plane themselves. You know, you're not legally allowed to do that, but you can give them tasks. I mean, get your passengers to help you look out for traffic. Get your passengers to listen out on the radio so if your call sign is mentioned and you might have missed it, they can pick it up and let you know that air traffic control wants to speak to you. So if you've got a mate who wants to come along for the ride, if you've got a pilot friend, even better. It might be good if this is the first time you've done something like this. If you've ever been to Bendigo before and you haven't ridden on the trams, it's a good fun experience. I mean, you can come down, bring your kids. I think they run at weekends. If you don't have kids, bring someone else's kids or just ride it yourself. It's fun either way. Now, a lot of people think you should have a plan B when you're flying anywhere, but in my personal opinion, I always think you should have a plan C. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, obviously you have your plan A, which is your primary plan. That's where you want to get to today. Then you do have a plan B. You think, well, if I can't get there, I'll go to this airport instead. But never forget, and especially to some of you low time pilots out there, student pilots, maybe you're just about to go out on your first longer nav, just remember, you always have the same plan C, regardless of where you're going. And plan C is not to fly at all. Now that might sound silly, but I used that on this trip. When I was in Kalgoorlie and I really wanted to go to Perth, there were a bunch of people I wanted to meet, but the weather was really bad and it was probably marginal to get through. So my plan A was Perth. My plan B was maybe do I kind of go around and stay somewhere like Bunbury in the south or do I go a bit further north and stay somewhere there? It started to get a bit complicated and so I just said to myself, it's time for plan C. So always remember your plan C and it's there to be used if you need it. Oh, tram!
it um, needed to be the other way. Yeah. Now, when you're budgeting for your trip and you are doing a budget for your trip, right? When you do that and you budget for how much you want to spend on accommodation, add 25% on top of that because you're going to get some hotel cancellations along the way. Let me give you an example. On this trip, I had one night in Esperance and two nights in Fremantle, all of which I had to cancel within 24 hours and therefore lost my deposit on the hotel booking. Now, the reason I canceled was because of weather, because I couldn't get to those locations and I decided to stay in Kalgoorlie instead. And the thing is, if you have budgeted to know that you are gonna lose some money on accommodation, it makes it a lot easier to cancel them. But if you haven't budgeted that and you have this feeling that you need to get somewhere just because you've got somewhere already booked, that's kind of dangerous territory for pilots because you never want to feel like you're obliged to go somewhere. You always want to have that plan C available up your sleeve just in case you want to cancel the whole thing. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. There are a bunch more tips that I wanted to share. There's stuff to do with like the camera mounts on the wing, how we got permission for that, uh, filming permissions that you might need, things to do with navigation and planning and how I plan, all that kind of thing. If you want to know more about the planning that I've done behind this trip, let me know in the comments below. Let me know your questions and maybe I'll do a follow on video with some additional tips for you. And be sure to tune in on the next video on this channel because well, we're heading home. It'll be our last flight on the whole Outback adventure as we head into Melbourne. I'll see you then.